I would like to thank Sophia and Alexander for the invitation to present my ideas on how highly petrified society as ancient Egypt, respectively Egyptology, may contribute to develop or substantiate the um, research approach petrification. Um, very elementary for my presentation is my definition of research approach, which to me is predominantly just a tool for opening up research questions. I will share with you some ideas how that approach may be implemented from an Egyptological point of view, based on a quantitative focus, on a conceptual, and on a liquefaction focus. So if one looks into a dictionary, at least in a German dictionary, petrification, petrifizierung has just one meaning, which is fossilization, which is obviously quite useless for anything only up to 5,000 years old. But if we are looking at the actual compound petrification, it has stone in it as making in it. And for Egyptology, we immediately have a differentiation which is useful or maybe made useful to differentiate between something that is made from of stone, it's made like stone, or it is rendered in stone, made in stone. <coughs> I show you here a very, very, very rough um, selection of different kinds of artifact structures. You can develop it a lot. What is my really important point here is that for Egypt you can usually very very easily fill in what is deliberately petrified. So things which are deliberately made in stone, made like stone or rendered in stone. And we very often actually are in the lucky position that we also have organic materials preserved due to the very specific preservation conditions in Egypt. But still we will yeah, have to consider that very intensively. At this point, I just, for this specific workshop, want to point out two things, both regarding the architecture. The one on the pyramids, we have very clearly in the Old Kingdom very solid stone constructions. Our Middle Kingdom pyramids are made like stone. They are made out of brick, but they were covered with a stone layer. So what actually happens if you liquefy stone structures, don't build them well enough, they will actually end up with having nothing of the stone left because the stone is harvested and reused. If you are lucky for rebuilding, if you are unlucky by grinding it to use it as fertilizer or whatever. So organic mat material, we quite often have a chance to see in a petrified version as soon as really petrified structures are taken apart, nothing is left, just as an idea, keep it in mind. And the other thing which I think may be interesting as a parallel or something one could think about is the lowermost part where the direction goes not from the stone structure, which is then liquefied, but goes from the mud reed construction, which very, very characteristically for ancient Egypt gets petrified, gets rendered in stone in any depictions of doors or whatever. But what is very, very unusual and so far only known for the very earliest period of stone architecture is that mud and reed constructions actually get built in stone or are imitated in durable materials which we only have from the pyramid complex of Josa in the beginning of the third dynasty. What I want to do with that quantitative focus is to take those uh, meanings apart, those columns, and see what kind of research question may, be getting, may one get out of it. So we have a materiality focus for the meaning made from, made of stone, which would focus on questions what was made from stone, but also what was not made from stone, and what, why was it made either from stone or not from stone. And 
when we are looking once more at architecture, what becomes very obvious that stone was used mainly for two reasons, either for very practical ones, like all water-related structures in Egypt are made in stone, we have a nanometer there, or if they are either heavy-use items as door slats, or necessary constructional items as the stone gateways in large brick walls, they will be made of stone. The other big issue is to use it for conceptual reasons, where at least in architecture the key issue is eternity. Temples for the gods were built in stone and tombs were built in stone. Tombs are the houses for eternity, that's how they are actually called in ancient Egypt, so they are built in stone. What is actually quite interesting here once more for the context of yeah, the transferability is that we have the historiographic beginning of the Old Kingdom with the appearance of stone architecture. This is what we still say, 3rd dynasty Joseph starts our Old Kingdom, but the ancient Egyptian view would not agree with that. They didn't see a major break between the brick architecture before and the third dynasty. So they have the dynastic change, but they date their historical beginnings to the first dynasty, or at least to the second. <coughs> so let's have a look at the second meaning to be made like stone, which would focus on which characteristics were taken when imitating stone and petrifying something, which are the properties which are imitated how and why. And there once more we have maybe two issues. We can easily see the one is to turn something into something durable, which is the case of the um, faience matting imitation. And much more often the key issue is to use the appearance of stone by various means. Already very early on we have beads amulets rendered either in faience and glazed clay or actually in glazed other stones and glazed steatid to imitate semi-precious stones. We have very prominently wooden statues which are covered in plaster painted so that they appear like they were painted. Limestone statues, we talked already about the pyramid. Um, the key issue here to me is that we, it makes us really aware that we have properties which are geological, which were used because of their the geological value and many, many um, properties, reasons where the culturally invested property of the stone was the reason to use it. And the other issue, which perhaps is more important for Egyptology than for transfer, is that the question is, to which extent does that differentiation make sense in an ancient context? because the functional working would be the same. There would not have been um, perceived a difference in how useful a tomb statue made of wood in plaster or of stone. Let's come to the third one, um, the meaning of rendered in stone. This play focus once more very, I think, very important currently for Egyptology to use it more which was focused very much on how concepts were rendered in stone, why, and would really trigger our thinking more about, well, if we, have, if we have the lucky situation that we learn something about technology or on ornaments, attire or whatever, does that really reflect even minimally the actual contemporary life or don't we have to think more likely that it doesn't. What would be also an interesting question is whether that heavy petrification of concepts of technological issues would also have an impact on how those technologies develop. But those, yeah, we are going too far by that. Um, but yeah, the display focus would then really have as key challenge, as key issue, um, the petrification of concepts while the preservation focus would really focus on to which extent can we glimpse the ancient material complexity, 
how detailed substantiated are our reconstructions and what to me is really really important to yeah, really see that materiality, the preservation of materials always leads to a very heavy over petrification of our sources even without any deliberate petrification. If you are looking at Egypt and have the deliberate petrification as well, well, we are really forced into a picture which has not really any representativity to what was the original um, living context. So much for that. Let's very, very briefly go to the conceptual focus and what I term the liquefaction focus, um, the issue here is not to go what could be the meaning of petrification, but how could petrification be achieved. Petrification could be either direct or indirect, direct meaning is in stone, indirect, you know, on a more transfer level, it may be active or passive, by a human endeavor deliberately or by circumstance, <coughs> leaving us one square of primarily circumstantially preserved artifacts, concepts, materials, whatever, for eternity. Um, this conceptual approach would much more easily enable to focus on yeah, more conceptual issues on transfer level, as here in the case of petrification of history, where we could fill in the first square direct active petrification very easily with um, written accounts or image accounts of history which explicitly for eternity present one specific view how a historical event was taking place, whether that has anything to do with reality or not. That's how the Egyptian king has to be shown and that is petrified. And on the indirect level we could then look for other accounts which are not made in stone but are preserved or are even meant to preserve by storing papyri in a way that they would keep, that they are in the desert and would happen. We have it on wooden funerary stele autobiographical accounts which from their context very clearly show that they are meant for eternity. And on a more abstract level, a possibility to petrify would be to just recopy documents which are written on um, perishable materials. In that case, a bit difficult is the square passive direct petrification, but one could perhaps think of issues where the historical data is not deliberately given for um, eternity, but because the object that was written on was for practical reason made in stone as dilometer, nile level dates over the years or whatever. And the other one would be, for instance, petrification of landscape, where I started with the idea, okay, I can actually have um, petrified landscape, and I'm looking at the salinization, for instance, of the Fayum. And then, yeah, to think about how to fill in the other squares, what could be possibilities, and one would be for the unequal preservation to really have yeah, a look to which extent even the geological structure may be better preserved than others. Land cover yeah, is much more difficult to be certain, so we have there very unequal um, preservation um, for the active part to think about how the landscape has been structured, for instance by stone dams, which actually are explicitly against the annual destruction by the Nile flood, so they are meant perhaps not for eternity, but for some durability. But we can also find organic or mud structures which may actually preserve the natural equilibrium by allowing the annual flood and being rebuilt the next year. And very, very rough, just one slide idea of what I mean with the liquefaction focus within petrification is to focus on issues where we can see directly that the petrified mode of display and the contemporary context are so disagreeing, are so incompatible that they are forced to be changed. And to have a look at how that conflict, how that actualization adaptation 
is solved and what may be behind it is one example, the issue how foreigners were displayed originally as very generic, either Nubian, Libyan or Asiatic, and then in the New Kingdom with the spread of the empire, more direct contact with the individual towns were mentioned, and for instance then in the Persian period the actual way of depicting the person was not a bound captive anymore, but in comparison to the Persian um, depiction of supporting figures of the kingdom, they were given with raised hands and not as enemies, as captives. So that would be one potential case. Another could go into the direction of when you have differences, for instance, in style, in style, or in the canon, whether that really is a chronological issue, or whether those issues may be regional specifics, regional petrifications, and because of the shift, the regional shift of the power that petrified, the different petrified canon or style would come to the fore. But that is something I cannot substantiate at all. It's just yeah, an idea I got from thinking about how petrification can be made usable. So to conclude, the key gain, I think, for Egyptology is that petrification really forces us to question the typical Hochkultur and elite epigraphics approach, which is predominant still in mainstream Egyptology. It really forces Egyptology to think about what we are not looking at regarding materials, social segments, and research questions. And also, to me, very, very important that it shows to which extent academic historiography is still stuck in ancient petrified history constructions. The gain from Egyptology, I think, is to some extent the rather um, comprehensive corpus of sources, including written sources, which really indicate, highlight the issue, what is preserved, what is not preserved, how to deal with the very, very uneven preservation issue, the issue that we have co um, concepts which are petrified and also very, very strongly have um, culturally invested properties, which are the key issue for petrification. And Egyptology may actually provide some case studies in which to correlate social and material features, though in many cases they will probably not correlate, at least in all those which I have looked at so far. So in generally, to me, the key issue is that archaeological material really badly enhances petrification, or gladly, as one sees it, is, that active, deliberate petrification is actually a highly effective strategy for shaping future history perceptions. And in case that active petrification is successful, it is really a huge challenge to overcome the preconceived history constructions overcome from us. Thank you.